On June 2, 2012, DGP, the Center for Design and Geopolitics, held its second annual conference. Entitled Designing Geopolitics II, it was held in the Black Box Theater of Cal IT2, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology in La Jolla, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. A fellow named Dr. Fang Bin Jing. He is an academician at the China Academy of Engineering, and he was one of the primary designers of the so-called Great Firewall of China. And last year, he spoke at a conference there uh, on the Chinese internet. And at the conference, he said something I thought was really quite remarkable. Um, and that is, he used the example of Google to say that it was a pity that although Google had retreated from China uh, at the time, its service was still accessible. And the, his, I'll quote him directly. It's, it's like the relationship between riverbed and water. Water has no nationality, but riverbeds are sovereign territories. We cannot allow polluted water from other nation states to enter our country. Unquote. Now, to extend this figure of water from metaphor to relocation, consider that for, at least for European political geography, that the territorial contiguity coherency of nations was always defended by the naval capacity over the omnidirectional glacis of the ocean. In light of Google's recently filed, actually a couple of years ago now, patent on water-based data centers, this floating cyber infrastructure would in principle greatly reduce the energy and cooling costs of hosting and serving the peta and exabytes of data that will, as Larry's demonstrated, constitute the eventual planetary cloud computing platform. It may also symbolize the productive crisis of territorial jurisdiction and how truly pervasive computation may demand or activate uh, uh, may demand or activate new uh, uh, n n new forms of of cosmopolitan political habitats. Data centers, the hard technical core of the internet, um, as as not only are uh, opaque, invisible to us, regardless of how much interaction we may have it with them, as data as Larry has demonstrated. They also take up a huge amount of energy, uh, and um, and the energy to keep the processors uh, cool. So it was something like still only about two billion of the world's 6.7 or so billion people using the web in any given month. The anticipated growth curve is steep. Where will the energy come from? Um, the ocean-based data centers, the access to, the, and so forth. So it makes logical sense in a certain set of sense, but. Um, from there, the political design issues will get that much more complex. What are the national rights of mobile users within this kind of cloud society, mobile subjects? Can you be bound to the data laws of your passport, no matter where, which country you go to? If you're an American, do you have rights to American data laws regard, on, on a transnational cloud through a secure pipe? Can your cloud follow you, and should it? Can your cloud be a prim your primary sovereign territory? Should individual servers fly the flag of a certain nation state, disseminate data according to those specific laws, even if the server may be across the world or across the street? Or should they be determined by where you are standing right now? Sort of civis Roman assume the particular data laws of a particular site try to construct and contain the flows of one particular spot, regardless of the sovereign origins of the sender or receiver the last mile determining everything. All of these options are counterintuitive, but what else options are there? What, what, what even if the server farms are outside of territorial waters altogether in the middle of an ocean? Now, Peter Cowie has spent his career thinking about such problems, designing the policies that would help us meet these challenges, and will talk to us a little bit today about the paradoxes in the situation by which these kinds of networks, on the one hand, may suggest a dissolution or perforation of particular kinds of Westphalian models of state sovereignty, while at the same time providing the basis for the consolidation, reinforcement, reinstantiation of state, of state control under other kinds of circumstances. Peter Cowie is the Dean and Qualcomm Professor of Communications and Technology Policy at the School of International Relations here at UC, and Pacific Studies here at UC San Diego.
In the Clinton administration, he served as senior counselor and then chief of the International Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission during its overhaul of the global competition policies and, for, and forging of, of a WTO agreement on telecom services. In 2009, uh, P Peter served 12-month assignment as the senior counselor to Ambassador Kirk in the office of the United States Trade Repre Representative under President Obama. His responsibilities included working with, with the ambassador on the strategic agenda for trade policy while supervising the work of USTR offices in America's Europe, Middle East, uh, and elsewhere. He serves on the Binational Exports, Experts Group, appointed by the U.S. and Chinese governments on innovation policy, and recently served as chief policy officer for the Aspen Institute's International Digital Economy Accords Project. So it's, he's a, also a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. It's my pleasure to welcome Peter Cowie. We don't have batteries on the pointer, uh, and uh, the uh, so if you'll just put up the and compared to Larry, uh, I promise you uh, that uh, symbolically, while Larry has talked about the potential of transformation, uh, I'm talking about inertia, uh, which is why you have a PowerPoint here symbolically. <laughs> the uh, and I've calling this talk Clouded Futures and Sovereign Sunshine uh, because, in fact, I think Benjamin is correct that we have uh, uh, a classic problem of changing technological horizons uh, that have to be dealt with by established uh, political organizations. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, the first thing I want to stress uh, as sort of a counterpoint to Larry is that you can't understand the expansion of the cloud uh, as it has occurred in, without thinking about the economic forces that are going on at a global level. And Larry has emphasized the uh, technological frontier. But let me stress a couple of points about the transformation in the structure of global economic flows that the cloud and its predecessors in information technology have been so critical to. Um, when you read about outsourcing and the growth of the global supply chain, this has been more broadly conceptualized uh, by international economists as the emergence of a trade in tasks. Now, tasks include, you know, the uh, in the famous New York Times story about uh, the making of the iPad uh, in China, uh, the important thing was partly about the labor story, but the more interesting part of it was that all of the major component suppliers necessary for a sophisticated technological product were there in the same location from around the world. So that when you needed a different type of glass for the iPad, Corning was there, ready to redesign upon demand. So that's the beginning of the growth in trade and tasks, but that's going to uh, change as well. Uh, um, here's an example. Uh, we always had an assumption that services were primarily local and then goods were potentially tradable globally. And of course, that gave way with information services and technology where that's a globally traded service sector and accounting and finance became global. But here's one that is going to be potentially tradable. A large part of the value added of going to a hair salon can be traded because color, tinting, and design are all design services that can be done on a global basis. So the best tint for your hair, you can go to an expert in Bangladesh. Cheaper than using the time of an expert hair cutter in the United States for part of the service and you'll get a blended service, the cutting here, the design there. The point is the growth in trade and tasks applies to every stage in the value chain, and it's expanding because the value of information and design in every product is rising and in transition more rapidly. Now, the beginnings of this transformation have already changed the way that the flows of commerce and the world economy work. Basically, we've seen the emergence of low- and middle-income countries, not just China, but across the board, uh, taking a much larger share of total global commerce. And the number I picked out here is that world exports 
doubled in roughly a 14-year period from uh, those countries. They're now 43% of global exports. And with that has arisen a whole new vector of South-South trade, low- and middle-income countries trading with each other rather than being, in a sense, funneled through the traditional wealthy countries. And along with that is, of course, the growth of a new middle class. And of course, these are always statistical manipulations where you try to approximate what constitutes a better living standard when there are, in fact, widely uh, varying national income levels. But using reasonable guesses, Roughly 93% of the world's middle class will be in these low and middle income countries by 2030, a major transformation in the commercial markets of the world. Next slide, please. So uh, could I get the side pictures up at this point as well? So let's take this first one. This is uh, a map of the Hanseatic League. It was a big deal in 1241. The Hanseatic League was the key trading and innovation center of Europe in 1241. And it was literally a league of city-states. If you would asked a smart political scientist in 1241, where would you place your bets on the future, they might have said, it'll be a confederation of city-states like the Hanseatic League. So that's one type of political organization. Now, if you flip forward a little bit, however, uh, you will see on the lower right-hand side, uh, if you could blow that up, that lower right-hand side, right, that's the Magna Carta, 1215, right? The barons at Runnymede facing King John. Great story, enormous seminal transformation for all of the history of democracy but also especially important in uh, the Anglo-American uh, political tradition. Now, the interesting story about uh, the Magna Carta is the one that you don't read about, which is that the following year, uh, King John's advisors decided they wanted to uh, renege. And so they went to the Pope and got a papal bull declaring the Magna Carta to be a violation of church law. The interesting story here, of course, is Nobody cared, right? And so what we had here was the beginning of the notion that sovereign political bargains internally to countries defied the reach of church law. Now, uh, I'll go and uh, return to this theme in a short while. Can we shrink the Magna Carta again? Uh, not that it's of shrinking historic significance, but... <laughs> So what emerged was the beginnings of a transformation that I'll return later to uh, that's built around that city of Westphalia symbolically, which Benjamin has already referred to. But I want to skip ahead in history to point out that what emerged over hundreds of years of political experimentation, just thinking about the tradition of democracy, were in fact a wide variety of patterns of political authority within the notion of a nation state and democratic systems. So the idea that we live in a world of nation states or a democratic nation state world does not tell you much of what you want to know about what I would take to be the chief uh, challenge that Benjamin's put forward to me today, which is how can we think about changing patterns of political authority in a world with dynamic economics and technological factors? So in fact, the way uh, we resolved these issues varied a great deal by country. Uh, let's shrink Westphalia uh, down. Boy, if I could lose weight at that rate, it would be wonderful. The, uh, so take, for example, uh, two uh, primary factors in the organization of democratic nation states. One is whether they have federalism or not. Federalism radically decentralizes parts of political power. And the choice between a federal and a non-federal system is a major political design issue. The United States grew out of a confederation of quasi-autonomous colonies. It moved to a federal system. England had, inside of England itself, 
a unified government in its way. Interestingly enough, even outside of the democratic system, we find this as a fundamental design choice. China is not a unified political structure. It is a federal structure with a unified power of the party over it. But the party's dynamics internally reflect the realities of federalism. Consociational democracies. Uh, this isn't found in any constitution, but here's a way of understanding this story, which is we have societies that have had traditions of deep cleavages by ethnic or religious lines. And when you design democratic systems, you often have found the systems designed to allow for a formal structure of guaranteed power sharing across these deep cleavages. If you want to go to a really extraordinary version of this, when Austria was first uh, allowed to become a neutral country uh, early in the Cold War by Russia, the country was structured so that Catholics and Protestants not only shared political power, but even the managing directorships of the state-owned enterprises like Austria Airlines was divided exactly 50-50 between Catholic and Protestant executives, which was why it had the worst of cuisine and efficiency if you could find in the world. So as you start to think about this, we have lots of ways of devolving and sharing and structuring power within these larger structures that we call nation states or democracies. And of course, the European Union itself is an experiment in evolving centralization of power upward from nation states. And uh, in the sunnier moments of European Union political thinking, there have been speculations that that evolving power upwards over the areas of commerce uh, inside the European Union would mean devolving political power towards regions within the nation states over time. Uh, the recent history of the experimentation with the uh, euro suggests that there may be other outcomes that you can think of for the European Union experiment. But it is a huge experiment in a limited transformation of power in order to deal with very large scale economic and technological forces. Next slide. So now I want to get specifically to the sorts of forces that uh, Larry uh, so uh, brilliantly showed us in his first uh, presentation. A major function of any state historically is to create, control, and disseminate information. That is a uh, as well as the issue of security, uh, really a primordial function of states. This happens for a lot of reasons, but one of the major reasons is that the economies of collecting information and sharing it and verifying it didn't work that well if in the hands of the private sector or the equivalent of nonprofit organizations like the church in an earlier period. You wanted that information wrestled out of those institutions and into some public authority that both had the resources and, in a sense, the structured neutrality of the public sector to create information and disseminate it. So one of the major characteristics of the growth of this global information infrastructure that Larry was describing was that it was under the control of governments very, very tightly. As a matter of fact, for those of you from Europe and outside the United States, the tradition was that the primary information infrastructure of uh, telecommunications and broadcasting was largely underneath the ownership and control of the state, even in democracies. Now, even in the United States, it was monopoly that was tightly regulated, uh, or in the case of broadcast, a limited oligopoly of a few providers that was tightly regulated. One of the first huge transformations that we've seen as a result of the technological frontier in front of us that has been so rapidly changing was the breaking of that monopoly of the state over the information and communications infrastructure. And uh, as Benjamin's introduction suggested, that was uh, uh, part of my job in the Clinton administration to make sure that happened on a global basis. If you want a sense of the scale of the stakes that were involved and to show you what the issue of control and the logic of control implies, in 1994, 
the average cost of an international long distance call from the United States, which was the lowest price structure in the world, was approximately 75 cents per minute. So in today's dollars, that would be over a dollar a minute. Okay. Now, uh, a telephone call required uh, a dedicated channel of about 64K. Now, what was happening in 1994 was, of course, the emergence of the commercialization of the web and the emergence of the large-scale internet and the beginnings, really, of the large-scale data flows at a much larger level than anything we had ever imagined. So transport that pricing structure over to Larry's story of a 10 gigabit pipe, right? And you understand that fe the feasibility of that traditional structure of control and its pricing incentives, which flowed from that structure of control, would have been impossible in this world. So we made a major choice in governance to change that, to move it to the private sector. But that transformation in government control of the information infrastructure doesn't mean that the government's totally out of this business. Larry showed you those global fiber optic pipes. If they flow across an ocean and land in a country, there is still an elaborate licensing system, including security vetting, that goes into every one of those landing points. And the licensing system allows for all sorts of controls. One of the reasons why there can be a great firewall is that every landing point into China is carefully controlled and monitored. Now, this story is not just one of the rise of the industrial scientific age. Um, remember Bethlehem? Well, what was that all about? There was a census, right? And the census was for what? The gathering of information for the running of the empire. And what else? Taxation. So the census, the gathering of information by the state, has long been tied to the power of the ability to tax. Up on the upper right-hand side, can we blow that up a little? This is from Puerto Rico. Uh, it's uh, roughly turn of the century. It's a customs house. Every harbor in any country that was coherent had a customs house. And if you look at the history of taxation, the primary form of taxation for most countries that had any maritime commerce ability was the tariff. The first act of legislation by the United States Congress was a tariff. Why a tariff rather than a, another form of taxation? The answer was that if you had to land a good, you could count the good at the custom house and put a tax on it. The ability to monitor the flow of commerce at this bottleneck made it the logical point for taxation. <laughs> And so one of the lessons that we should understand is that the growth of the census and other forms of collecting information and tracking individuals made possible the transformation of taxation systems such as the rise of the income tax. And coincidentally, the rise of the income tax is the primary source of government, along with things like value-added taxes at a later stage, represented the ability for governments to withdraw their dependence on tariffs as a source of income and thus open the way to free trade as a practical financial option in the modern world economy. So information is always intimately tied to taxation and control decisions. And finally, of course, the growth of the modern state and the modern scientific informed society has depended upon the growth of regulatory reporting and monitoring. Here's the classic example, the public health service, right? Every time certain diseases are reported, they have to, are detected, they have to be reported to a public health service. We have ongoing monitoring. We wouldn't think of running a modern society without that capacity. So, next slide, please. Let's think about what the story of transformation that Larry has suggested can tell us for the future. So the first thing that we ought to think about is that this ability, uh, not just to uh, process data in the cloud, but to detect and monitor them, 
just as Larry detects and monitors his behavior about his body, not just with those moments when he's uh, wired up, but every day with his wireless monitors and other things, or the ability to have monitoring uh, on a ubiquitous basis for the environment, where we replace large uh, centralized monitors for air pollution with small chips on essentially mobile uh, terminals that are a fraction of the cost and have every bit of the power, means that we are starting to see the beginnings of alternative ways of monitoring and reporting about global and national and local dynamics. One that breaks, in a sense, the monopoly of the state over the monitoring and information building sector. As a matter of fact, what its implication is, as we're starting to see, is the growth of alternative drug trials, right, from the grassroots up. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how do you make that into a valid piece of scientific information? What would be the protocols? But no longer does it have to be organized in the same way by the FDA protocols. We're starting to start to see that. Environmental monitoring. In China today, the government publishes its statistics on air quality, and on the web, you find the real statistics being published by people with independent monitoring numbers, including, I might add, the U.S. Embassy, which puts on the web its findings off the embassy web grounds every day. So we can start to think of this as a transformation that changes the space for thinking about control and monitoring and oversight capabilities. Here's the link to uh, taxes. Uh, I don't think that the cloud means that we're going to have a global tax uh, system through the cloud in a straightforward way. Uh, after all, as Larry showed you, the example of carbon demonstrates that even within national boundaries, there's no straightforward way that we've used the tax system to deal with the problem of carbon emissions. As a matter of fact, the first uh, two rules that you learn about in policy analysis in my school is every economist will tell you a carbon tax is the right way to start tackling the incentives to deal with uh, the carbon emission problem. And rule number two is there is no way in hell that will ever be passed in the foreseeable future. Therefore, you're looking for alternative number three, whatever it might be. So here's an example of how you can imagine transformation with information and taxation which is the rise of global corporate social responsibility. Things like green supply chains and green reporting systems, which now every Fortune 100 country company has. Now, every one of those systems involves a type of monitoring of corporate worldwide activities done in partnership with some type of outside monitoring organization to varying extents, all right? That's possible because of the cloud and the reporting systems tied to the cloud. And when you think about it and you back this out, you realize that what we're creating is a type of a quasi-taxation system for global corporate activities for the biggest players. They are agreeing to accept additional costs of monitoring and organizing a green supply chain in order to get some type of social legitimacy. Now, there are claims that the economic efficiency of this will make it uh, pay for itself, but that's no different than the argument that lots of taxes correct social incentives in ways that in the long term pay off for the participants in the system. So it's a new type of taxation system without any government passing the tax. Let me also point out uh, the case of information dissemination and cascades. Um, uh, lower slide here, uh, you all recognize, is uh, the Gutenberg uh, printing press. The Gutenberg printing press is 1440. It represents a radical change in the economics and uh, technological capacity for the dissemination of information, right? And not surprisingly, it takes about 70 years for the full implication of Gutenberg to play out, which is down here. Martin Luther was basically a printing press with a mouth, right? He, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean that he fundamentally would not have been possible without the information dissemination dimension that the Gutenberg printing press had allowed so that the burning of the theses uh, that he did uh, in 1517 so famously uh, took on a dimension that led to a rethinking of the relationship between the church and state and religion. 
And from that came uh, a deeper change. And uh, could I go back to Westphalia somewhere? So here's Westphalia today. It's a lovely uh, canal city, prosperous center. It was tied uh, to the Hanseatic League historically. This is the symbolic changing ground for sovereignty in the history of the Western world. The Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 recognizes that the only way to resolve the civil wars among the German states over religion, Protestantism versus Catholicism, was to introduce a radical new rule about the power of the state, which is the state got to choose the religion. The religion didn't get to verify the state. Now notice that Westphalia wasn't changed. It was still Westphalia as a city at that time. We didn't have a united Germany, but its power and authority boundary had changed as a result of this fundamental struggle about belief that was enabled by the spread of information uh, along the way. Uh, the story that goes on from this, and uh, this is, I'm almost at my end, is if you trace this out, eventually uh, the spread of the growth of the modern urban and large-scale trading economy sets the grounds for the real consolidation of the modern nation state over time, because you have to create a national identity for these consolidated regions. And the nation state proved to be a larger great geographic territory that was more efficient for lots of the purposes of a state. But along with that, you had to win support. Uh, and when we say, for example, sometimes, you know, I'm at an age now where I say, ah, you younger scholars uh, in the crowd, you know, you and your generation will represent the hope of the future. Remember that the biggest and hardest edge core cadre for Bismarck in creating G German nationalism was the German university students of the day. He very cleverly played to that population. So change doesn't necessarily mean enlightenment in the short term, although it leads to unexpected consequences over time. Let me take an example of two other phenomena that we often associate with this information and communications rich world. The Arab Spring, well we all could tell the story, oh yes, they twittered, they did this, they did that. There was nothing fundamentally different in that, in my judgment, from what went on in the French Revolution, or if you read the stories of uh, recorded in the archives of British and French colonialism, the way that they carefully monitored the behavior of the commercial bazaars in the key cities, because that was where there was always the possibility of insurrection starting from rapid communication uh, among people. What I think may be a more interesting implication of the Arab Spring is how the political settlement is done following the uprising. Because that is always in play, and the pattern of information and the broader dissemination of information means that the players who will be engaged in the settlement process will be different than in the traditional uprising scenarios. And that we do not understand. A final example here, and here I am really relying on the work on information cascades that was created uh, to explain advertising fads, which is that we often displace our own judgment and information by group information in certain circumstances that we can model. And we rely on that, hopefully, to sustain it for things like normative change in the right direction, anti-smoking campaigns. But when we look at the record globally of using name and shame, trying to spread information to embarrass people and build a normative consensus, the biggest finding we have is that it has a very mixed record. It can raise consciousness, but if not linked to traditional sanctions, it often does not produce results. Next slide. So here's an example of a new capability uh, that people claim comes directly for civil society because of the cloud. This is Kiva. It's a great, cool organization. It's an anti-poverty organization using microfinance. You go to the Kiva website, and they say, here's Kiva, and there's the World Bank and those traditional commercial bankers, and we're totally unlike them. And why are we unlike them? Because we connect people to people directly using the cloud. You give the money, $25, and you can choose the picture of the person that you're giving the grant to, all right? Cloud, breaking out the traditional financial intermediaries for direct anti-poverty action. 
Great idea. However, it's not really true, all right? I don't mean that they don't get money to the people that they're giving to, because they do. They have a very good record. They also have a very good record of monitoring the loans and showing for repayment. All true. But in fact, they had to replicate the banking system through a new channel. Every Kiva client is selected and groomed by a microfinance institution, which is a new type of banking system on the grounds in these countries, and they cherry pick their clients to put up the best potential lending targets. And they are defined as attractive to lenders, and two, they have a record of characteristics that will make them likely to repay. And so what we have done in non-banking, or traditional banking terms, is replicate the banking system, but with more direct action uh, as an identification of both sides. So authority patterns and intermediation remain even in this flat world with reinvented institutions. Next slide. So here are, to get to the uh, issue that Benjamin pointed, are two examples of fights we're having today about the cloud. The first is about cloud data flows, privacy, and personal data. And those storage centers that Larry talked about, they're huge. They require certain specific characteristics, like cheap power. They have to be in secure places, a whole set of other things. They are gigantic investments. A billion dollars is the bottom starting point for one of these centers. So what does that imply? It implies that data centers can't be everywhere, and national boundary lines don't make sense for defining where you put the cloud or organization. But this in turn means that this data of companies and citizens are going to reside in places which are not controlled by the country. So what are going to be the rules governing that data? Well, the first question is, will countries allow that to happen? Will they allow the data centers to operate and allow data to flow across national boundaries freely enough to allow this infrastructure to exist? So that is a matter of great debate right now. The way the companies are solving the problem de facto is two things. The first is they are strategically placing the data centers in various corners of the world so there's at least something in your broad geographic neighborhood that they can point to. And number two, they are working to try to get an agreement among governments that you should not constrain data flows across borders except for very particular exceptions. The presumption is free flow of data. Now, that depends upon an agreement about rules about privacy of information. That is the hot political issue. I don't want to get into the details of the privacy debate except to point out the following. What we're seeing is the movement towards the coordination of the largest traditional centers of information technology, the US and the EU, to find a compatible set of rules for privacy protection. And the data centers are promising they will tag data according to national origin to apply the applicable regional rules. And then if you can get the regional rules made more compatible, the task gets easier in messy cases. But here's the next channel, two issues we're going to face. The first is what's called safe harbors, and the second is personal data portability. The second is Larry. Larry develops his data in part, let's say, by wearing his Nike trainers, which are all going to have sensors in it to monitor his behavior while exercising. If he switches to Adidas, what happens to his data? Does he get to take it with him, right? So are we going to have a global rule that recognizes personal data portability no matter where it's stored in the cloud underneath any corporate authorization? That's a question. Two, safe harbors and mutual recognition. So let's say that you build, a, oh, a Facebook or a YouTube on a server on a cloud storage facility, and there is let's be surprised, a violation of copyright by somebody downloading a show that's just been shown the night before on NBC. Big question, what to do? Well, we have a notion that you can have a policy that as long as the ISP or the YouTube is notified and they take it down promptly, that's called a safe harbor. They've done their good due diligence upon notification of a violation of the law. But that's always a messy policy. There are lots of questions involved. So here's one. 
Should you extend safe harbors to web platforms that don't also recognize human rights? This could apply to commercial uh, websites in all sorts of ways. So these are the sorts of debates we're going to face. Security, we could talk about in a similar way. There are a series of efforts to try to reconcile national rules and set boundaries around national authorities to allow security to be enhanced without allowing governments to use security as an excuse for limiting human rights. Last slide. Here's the only point I want to make about uh, the new form of uh, netizenship. A lot of these techniques for dealing with these technology issues that cross borders because of the cloud is to bring in what are called multi-stakeholder organizations. And they typically are companies and nonprofits who sit around and try to establish some mutually agreeable principles and then set up some sort of a monitoring system that will make sure that people are more or less complying to the rhetoric. All right? Two things to notice about these systems. The first is that governments still have to sign off on the system being accepted as fulfilling public policy mandates. So governments have an ultimate veto about the acceptance of these arrangements. Here's the second thing to know, that governments and many of the stakeholders involved move to more and more participants in the multi-stakeholder decision system because the broader the range of participants, the less likely that any one group or subgroup of participants will dominate with their preferences in the final policy selection. In political science, we call this the rule of the median voter. And the point here is not that every system is going to look like that, but old political solutions to issues of exercising authority show up even in the newest contexts. And with that, I leave the question ultimately that Benjamin raised of where will we go with this? Thank you. Thank you.